Light is fast. It's the fastest fast. But sometimes I have trouble remembering just how fast light is. What are those exact values? So why don't we just work from the simplest values that we can remember? That helps me sometimes. Light can travel a third of a meter in just one nanosecond, about a foot in one nanosecond. Now that fascinates me just as a little factoid, but you can work up from there all the way to light speed. So a third of a meter in a billionth of a second. So then in a second, light can travel a billion thirds of a meter. And what's one third of a billion? It's about 300 million. And then you divide that by a thousand to go from meters to kilometers and you have 300,000 kilometers per second, which huh, is the speed of light. And look at that, that wasn't so hard. And welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, corrections, and weird personal stipulations about what you can and can't mention while doing realistic Pokemon calculations and address them here with the help of chemicals. I, I thought there was nothing in there. Oops. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, it's another interesting but pointless thought experiment. Kind of sums up most of my career. But getting right to it, we actually have two episodes of Because Science to get to this week. First, about lasers and how powerful they can get in uh, relation to the Fallout universe. And in the second, what is the most powerful Pokemon Generation 1 starter? I said that Fallout lasers, if they wanted to get to the highest power output that we know of so far, that we humans have been able to do, you're talking about terawatts, and I took you to the largest and most energetic laser facility on the planet. It's really cool inside of there, so go watch that video if you haven't yet. I know it wasn't on the same schedule. And in the Pokemon video, I said that Charizard would be the most energetic starting Pokemon, because if you could melt boulders with your breath, that involves gigajoules of energy, which is far and away the most energetic compared to Blastoise and Venusaur. But what did you have to say? I should clean that up. Let's start with some comments on the laser video. First, Dalton Sealer says, wasn't aware California was where the plans for the Death Star were being created. <laughs> no, seriously. One of the scientists there said at the National Ignition Facility, they're working on a way to focus and add energy to laser beams that converge on a point and form a plasma and then fire out uh, another la laser beam that's more energetic from that concentrated point. Just like the Death Star. They're doing it here on Earth in California. Rebels. You may fire who are new Hmm. Another good comment on the laser video comes from Nat20, who says, while not as entertaining, laser weapons could be so much more terrifying if they went with the more realistic audio-visual characteristics, which is basically nothing. Imagine you and your buddies standing next to you talking about super mutant stuff, you know, raiding, grunting, <laughs> and where you'll hang up newest bag of pulverized bipartisans. When suddenly, with no sound or visual cue to speak of, one of them just bursts into flames or suddenly replaced with a pile of dust. No pew, no whoosh, no beam, it's just gone. Yeah, what all of science fiction usually focuses on with laser weapons is the actual sight of the laser, seeing the laser beam move and hearing like a pew pew or something like that, where in reality, you probably wouldn't see the laser beam travel at all and you wouldn't hear it travel either. When it impacted the target, it would do a vaporization kind of explosion of the clothes and of the skin, which would be ragged and horrible, but what actually really scares me the most about laser weapons is that even a reflection off of some shiny surface, even if you weren't the target, can instantly and permanently blind you like that. There's even a ban, a worldwide ban on weapons that are made exclusively to blind other people in a battle. We have lasers that could do that so quickly and so easily and so efficiently we put a ban on it and that's what scares me. Real laser weapons uh, could just blind you in an instant and I'd much rather get a laser flesh wound like say Princess Leia got in Return of the Jedi when she was defending the bunker or whatever than being permanently blinded instantly by a handheld weapon. That is terrifying and we almost never see that in media. So, JJ, put it in there. Moving on to the Pokemon video, one good comment comes from Tom Morgan who says, I'm curious whether Charizard is actually the best starter Pokemon if you consider Pikachu as well. Charizard still has him beat in the jewels department. A single lightning bolt contains roughly five 
billion joules compared to what I calculated, which was nine, but I don't see any indication of time in your estimation of Charizard's ability to melt granite. Would it be an instantaneous bolt of five billion joules? Would that outmatch a sustained potential flame with nine billion joules behind it? <sighs> so I think you bring up a really good point, Tom. I didn't consider Pikachu because I just went with generation one red and blue for the widest amount of, hey, I remember that thing, but Pikachu, if it can summon down uh, bolts of lightning, then it definitely contends with Charizard. I've seen ranges for the energies of a lightning bolt to be anywhere from 1 billion to 10 billion, which puts it on Charizard level. But I didn't go through all of that math because it didn't fit with the three starters that I was doing. But maybe that's something that I will do in the future. Maybe when Detective Pikachu comes out. It's made by the people who pay me, so why not? Our next good comment from the Pokemon video comes from Chewy007. <laughs> they say, my son is gonna love this episode, thanks for doing one, but you left me with a couple of questions. And then Chewy007 <laughs> goes on to say, isn't there a time element to Charizard's energy? Couldn't you apply the same kinds of estimations that you did for Venusaur and Blastoise to Charizard to see what the power output would be? Wouldn't that be even better? And then uh, he, she, they goes on to say, did you remember to only use half the amount of water for Blastoise because there's two cannons? Well, first, I did not consider power as what we were uh, evaluating all the starters on, the energy over time, because I did not want to estimate and assume more than I had to. You can see in the episode that I picked time values for how long it would take uh, Venusaur to charge up Solar Beam or how long it takes Blastoise to shoot out a Hydro Pump, but that's only because I really had to. I do not like estimating stuff uh, from whole cloth. We can see what they do in Pokemon Stadium, or the games, or the manga, or the movies, and you'd have a, a very large range of values, and then you could say pretty much whatever you wanted to say. So I stuck with energy so I could make the minimum amount of assumptions possible. And I know a number of you had that same comment. I didn't use power because I'm trying to remain as simple as possible. Otherwise, the more speculation you add, the more mm, fudgeable the numbers are. It's a technical term. To your second point about how much volume Blastoise is pumping out of his shell or body or whatever, here's the problem. There is a huge range in the amount of water that Blastoise can supposedly shoot out of its water cannons. As many of you pointed out in the comments, it might not just be the volume of his shell or the volume of its body. It could be an unlimited supply of water somehow magically generated from inside of him. And he fires much more water in some iterations of Hydro Pump than could be contained in a turtle that's only five feet tall. So there's a very large range in energy values that we could get. And if you divide those energy values by two, you can still get the range that I got, which is, most importantly, somewhere between Charizard and Venusaur, right in the middle. So given that range, it's close to Venusaur, a little bit above or in the middle, and below Charizard by a factor of a thousand. So even though there's a large range in the assumptions that we could make about where the water is coming from and how much water is there, our conclusion is still the same. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode comes from the Fallout laser video, and I really like this one, from the Dragon Knight, who says, we can assume Kyle's special stats based on what we've seen him doing and assuming that 10 is average on the normal level. I'd say strength 13 to 14 because he does rock climbing. Although he is not that buff, he seems stronger than the average person. Come on! Okay, uh, perception, 11 to 12, because in the Deadeye episode, we demonstrated that he has a slightly above average reaction time. Not true. Uh, endurance, I'd say 14 to 15, since he did four laps in the Fallout Laser video episode and he didn't seem that tired. <laughs> I really wasn't. Charisma, 15 to 17. Contrary to popular belief, nerds are actually really nice and charismatic. Although some are really shy, and Kyle is living proof. This charisma one is nice, but it is, it is not true. I work very hard to seem charismatic here, but it is not my natural state. My natural state is closer to... Yeah, sure. But you can turn it on and turn it off, baby! 15 to 17, I'll take it. Intelligence, <laughs> needless to explain, 17 to 18. <laughs> agility, I'd say 13 to 14 because he seems to have an athletic build. Oh, you mean like this kind of agility? Yeah. Uh, luck, I'd say 20 because we are the lucky ones to have him in because science. We love you, Kyle. 
hey, thanks. That wasn't a professional thank you, that was a real one. And why am I doing this in the middle of social studies class? Because science, I hope that this is nerdy enough. Indeed it is. Stop commenting on how my body looks, but you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> Tiny one. I would say that I'm a better rock climber than 99% of people. Easy. And I will stand by that. Even better than Jared Leto, who climbs at my gym. And Jason Momoa, who also climbs at my gym. Calling you out. It's fine. I can back it up. I can back it up. I but of course, I'm not always right. There were a couple instances in the Pokemon video where I was saying numbers that didn't match the math that I was doing on screen. Sometimes that happens when I am rushing. We have a lot of projects going here uh, on this channel, so I apologize if not everything fit with what I was saying and doing at the same time. I will try my best to do better. So what else did I get wrong this week and last week? And nope, just this week. The biggest correction from the Fallout Laser video comes from Dragon Pups, who says, Kyle, you can't fast travel to a place you haven't discovered yet, as I showed. Technically, you should have only been able to place a marker there, but it's probably one of the rare, extremely rare glitches, like fast traveling with enemies nearby, like you also did. Yeah, yes, yeah, no, of course. I mean, look, I had the, the location already marked on my map by an NPC, uh, so I actually just fast traveled to a location uh, near it even though that location was highlighted by my cursor. And then I got the experience for discovering the right next to what I traveled to. I thought all that through. Uh... Our next correction, this time from the Pokemon video, comes from Alex Nunez, who says, my problem is that you're using a Pokedex entry for Charizard, but not for Blastoise or Venusaur. A lot of you had the same problem, and one of you, we will get to, points out another very cool Pokedex entry for Blastoise specifically. But here's the problem. I went with just Generation 1, red and blue, so it had the most applicability to all of the Pokemon series, and the it would be the situation that most people would know as you grew up with Pokemon. You can see my point if you go to the actual Pokedex entries for Venusaur and Blastoise in Generation 1 like I did for Charizard. I can show you why I didn't use them, because uh, for Venusaur, it says, the plant blooms when it is absorbing solar energy. It stays on the move to seek sunlight. Not a whole lot there to add into our analysis. And for Blastoise, it says a brutal Pokemon with pressurized water jets on its shell. They are used for high-speed tackles. See, so there's, there's not as much to work with as there was for Charizard, which is why I used Charizard's Pokedex entry specifically. It was so interesting. But if you go further on in the generations, you can find more interesting things. Like in Ruby and Sapphire, Blastoise says it can hit empty cans from a distance of 160 feet. Now that's a lot of interesting math, but if we picked and choose the Pokedex entries that we wanted, then we'd have to start including other Pokemon from those generations and other starting Pokemon, and then you couldn't make it about starting Pokemon from generation one as a video title. Yeah, so that is why I just used the Charizard Pokedex entry. I think it's simpler and it still proves my point. But then another correction from David Kellen says, the fact that Blastoise has rocket cannons on its shell that fire water jets capable of punching holes through thick steel, according to another Pokedex entry, uh, in the silver version is absolutely terrifying. The water jet cutter that we used in my engineering college was 600 million pascals, which is an insane amount of pressure. I think you may be underestimating Blastoise's power. You know what? Fine. I did extra math for this. So what would have to change if we want Blastoise's water cannons to be able to punch through steel? Well, he's gonna be the same size and the cannons are gonna be the same diameter, which means he'll be filled with the same amount of water. So what can we change? Let's say the amount of time it takes for that water to come out because that would require more velocity, which would require more internal pressure um, and would produce more force at the end of the water jet, which given the same diameter area, surface area for the water jet would produce a higher pressure at the target. So let's do that. And when I did that and using your value of 600 million pascals, I got a time that wasn't five seconds, it was just 0.14 seconds. So less than two tenths of a second for hundreds and hundreds of kilograms to come out during a hydro pump. And if that happens, it changes our velocity that the water needs to come out at, it changes the kinetic energy therefore, and then the energy that you get for Blastoise's hydro pump is around 
600 megajoules, which is uh, a thousand times more than our initial calculation. So his hydro pump in that other Pokedex entry, if he can punch holes through steel, makes his attack a thousand times stronger. However, this is still megajoules and not gigajoules like we are dealing with for Charizard. So though you are right that we would have underestimated Blastoise's energy content for Hydro Pump if we uh, didn't use this Pokedex entry, it still fits in between Venusaur and Charizard because Venusaur is little and Charizard is a lot. So it's still in the middle and our conclusion is still the same, but the math is interesting and thank you for making me do it. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm going to give Arthur E. King 8472, who's talking about the Pokemon episode, who says, there's one small thing I'd like to point out. The argument could be easily made that Venusaur stores its solar energy in the form of carbohydrates like sugars that it could form when the sunlight uh, hits its flower. Arthur goes on to say that instead of assuming a 60 second charge up time, using these sugars and carbohydrates, Venusaur could be storing days worth of sunlight, converting them into sugar and then converting them back into energy and then releasing all of that energy. And if we assume that it can't have more mass uh, of all that stored energy than it is in a Venusaur, then to convert it all to sugar and assuming 1% efficiency and it does some math, 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 1.6 billion joules in a solar beam, which would push it past Blastoise's Hydro Pump, but it's still under Charizard's Flamethrower. Starting to get close to the level of Charizard, but not quite there. Dang it, Venusaur, I tried my best. You're right, you did try your best. I like the line that you took with carbohydrates and sugars and conversions and energies. It's a little bit more than I would probably get into because it's very complicated, but uh, for doing all that math and estimating and trying your best, you are indeed a super nerd. Ah, catch him. Look, there were a lot of great comments and corrections on both the Fallout video and the Pokemon video. And I just wanna remind you that the point of everything that we do on this channel isn't to change canon or say that something is dumb or not possible or this or that. It's to exercise our critical thinking skills and see what we can learn from the stuff that we love. In this day and age, it's more important than ever to make sure we have sharp critical thinking skills. Given something that we love, like Pokemon, can we think about it in a creative way and come to a fun conclusion and learn something about the world? It's not about changing it or anything like that. We need to be on our toes all the time, especially today. So. It's more about how we are doing this than the conclusions we are coming to. But keep all of those comments and corrections coming because that's what you're doing. We're all getting smarter together, I hope. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do on projectalpha.com, where if you sign up, you can get a free trial and this show two days earlier than anyone else and other premium content from Nerdist and Geek and Sundry and myself. But if you're not subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is, can the flash touch a lightsaber? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are going through a very bizarre but very fun thought experiment sent in to me by one of you. Over the years on this program, we have done many episodes about the flash and many episodes about lightsabers, like over an hour's worth or an hour and a half's worth, which is a lot of content. But what happens when you smash the two together? Is the flash fast enough to touch something that is so hot it can cut through anything? Ooh. <laughs> So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, both about Fallout and lasers and Pokemon powers. Follow Because Science at Because Science on social media, on Instagram and Twitter. And what else does this say? Oh yeah, Facebook.com slash Because Science. I'm reading it backwards. Facebook.com slash Because Science and YouTube.com slash Because Science. And do that. And have a great Thanksgiving if you are celebrating it. Mm, turkey to you. <laughs> That's what we say in America. Um, it's weird, yeah, when, during Thanksgiving, if you pass anyone on the street in the United States, people are like, mm -hmm, turkey to you. Mm -hmm, turkey to you, sir. What, do you not do that? And don't forget, medicine is the best medicine. I used to live in Los Angeles. I feel the need to say it. Now I don't know where I am. Do you know what they call our alternative medicine that works? Medicine.